Hi, my name is Rohan de Oliveira and I'm a composer. Over the last year or so, I've stopped using any sampled instruments in my orchestral template. Instead, I'm using multiple instances of audio modeling swarm instruments. Today, I'd like to show you how I do this. I'll be using as an example my recent mock-up of Gustav Holt's Mercury, the winged messenger from the planets. The best way to start would be to show you my template for this piece. Unlike a conventional template for sampled instruments which use a single sample string section patch, you'll notice that my string section is made up of multiple instances of uh, the swarm violin, violas, cellos and basses. These are organized in pairs, very much like how a real orchestral string section is. So you'll notice that we have the first stand of first violins, the second stand pair, the third stand pair, and so on. And the reason I've done this is with respect to divisi passages. The first uh, stand will always have the upper divisi line, and the second stand line will take the second divisi line. On the top of the template, um, I've got my woodwinds and they're structured more or less the same way. So here you have uh, three swarm flutes, two swarm oboes, an English horn, a bass oboe. We also have three clarinets, a bass clarinet, a bassoon, three bassoons and a contrabassoon. Uh, audio modeling hasn't released their brass instruments yet so I'm using brass instruments by sample modeling for this piece. Well, model instruments have an infinite range of expression and articulation and therefore sound incredibly real. I love the fact that I can control every performance and tonal aspect of my ensemble and don't have to rely on a set package of articulations provided by a sample library. I create every articulation and performance practice I need. However, to do this, model instruments require typically a much larger range of control input than just expression and modulation. I need to be able to generate 8 to 10 streams of MIDI control data at the same time and doing that with a standard MIDI control fader is obviously not possible. Uh, here's a MIDI fader and it's got 8 controls and to map each of these to a, a model instrument parameter and then manipulate this in real time is next to impossible. So my main MIDI controller is this little guy, a leap motion virtual reality controller. Let me show you how this works. Um, so if I bring up Gecko MIDI, which is a piece of software that translates the MIDI gestures, uh, uh, that tra translates gestures from my leap motion to MIDI control data, you can see MIDI streams coming out of the leap, moving various control parameters uh, on a swarm violin. So for example, moving Sorry, it's a bit hard to talk with a breath control breath controller in my mouth. So, like I said, breath control is my expression. Um, moving my hand up and down is uh, bow pressure. So I can do martelle strokes with. Um, just uh, by slamming my hand down. Um, pitching my hand forwards uh, gives me a modulation wheel, which is vibrato. And moving my hand left and right changes vibrato speed.
pitching my hand in the uh, Z axis, or rather rolling my hand, uh, adjusts my legato speed or portato speed. So for example, and moving my hand forwards and backwards changes my bowing position. So I go from the bridge, Sul Ponticello, which is quite brittle, to Sul Tasto, which gives me a warmer sound. And most importantly, rotating my hand in the y-axis adjusts my pitch bend. So because no violinist plays 100% in tune and it's very important in an ensemble that the intonation for each instrument is completely different or you do not get that choral effect. Other instrumental parameters are triggered with my Archi APC Ableton controller, which I've programmed uh, in Controller Mate. So say, for example, if I select strings in Logic, uh, we'd wind to the string section and select a viola because that's uh, the last string track I was working on. So let's open it up. And um, selecting uh, any of the lit options here allows me to say for example change uh, from standard bowing to tremolo slow tremolo and fast tremolo or harmonics um, or bowing up and down uh, string fingering bridge uh, open string middle register and polyphony, string articulation, pizzicato, collegno. Um, so basically during a performance, it's quite easy for me to select any of these options uh, in real time. So how does one make a section using model instruments? We, well, you'd assume that since swarm instruments sound so realistic, it would seem logical that multiple instances could easily make a great ensemble. However, when we hear an ensemble sound, what we're hearing is several very different performances by every member of an instrumental group. This can be either their playing style, the way they artic articulate their intonation, and also their technical ability. So for example, a um, first chair viola would probably pay, play more in tune than a sixth or seventh chair viola or be able to execute uh, difficult technical passages better. Each instance of a swarm violin is identical. Each has exactly the same tone and is perfectly in tune. So to make an ensemble, we've got to change things up a little bit. So here are four swarm violins, the first two stands. And if you'd notice the tuning on each, there's a very subtle difference. So they're not all quite in tune. And also each of them uses a different body. So uh, the first stand is a stereo Cremona 1. Second stand is Cremona Stereo 2. Uh, the second stand first is Firenze stand, uh, Firenze Stereo 1 and Firenze Stereo 2. So those body differences uh, adjust the overtone structure of each instrument and is our first step towards making a choral sound. So you've got that set up and um, so you think that basically um, the easiest thing to do would be to change the bodies of each instrument and then just play uh, an individual performance for each instance of each section. But, it's a big but, um, uh, first violin section here is 16 instruments, the second violin section is 14 instruments, we've got 12 violas, um, we've got 10 cellos, we've got 7 basses, that's a lot of tracks, so that's probably going to take a long time to do that. 
Um, so what I tend to do is I perform a single track for each position. So for the violins, I would say perform uh, uh, the first violin, first hand part, uh, the third violin, and maybe the sixth violin. And then what I do is I just simply copy and paste those into each track and then rename them, obviously. Um, and if I call up the automation or the controller data, um, you'll notice that there's very subtle variations in each of these. So what I've done is um, I've gone uh, over it with my mouse and then I follow the same contour, but then I just draw in control the data that's slightly different. So in this case, this is expression. Um, and each of these then has a very slightly different controller stream. So if we take pitch bend, so you notice again, there is subtle variances in pitch bend throughout the data. And once you get used to this, you can do this pretty quickly. So here's uh, bow pressure and bow position. And again, you know, similar contours, but uh, different controller streams. So that's controller data. We also need to adjust the note positions of each of these tracks because basically it's the same performance. So if I go to, if I select uh, note velocity in the, uh, in the uh, MIDI automation channel, you notice that, well, these are all slightly different. That's because what I've done is I've, op I've operated on them with a MIDI transform. So in Logic, I've made a preset which randomizes each note start position by 45 frames. So if I operate on this, what it does is it moves each note 45 frames left or right. And that goes a long way towards uh, simulating the different attacks that a group of musicians would place on the note. So say if you're playing a fast phrase, it would give you a very nice blurring. So it's not just enough to adjust the controller data for each instrument. The staging is very important because the early reflections of each instrument defines its position in a 3D space. And uh, each member of an orchestra has a uh, different early reflection. So to do that, I uh, use the very excellent Virtual Soundstage 2 by Parallax Audio. And as, uh, as you see here, I've got my violins in different staging positions. So the first two stands are in position one, which is here. The next couple of stands is in position two and the second violins and the tail end of the first violins are in position three. The reason I don't use more positions is because it just hits uh, my processor unduly and I've found that having more than three I really can't hear the difference. It's a little too subtle but it does make a difference. So let me play you a little bit of the first violin and move the first violin uh, in to the positions of the other instruments and you'll hear a very subtle change. Oh, you get the idea. So it's not just the position that I alter, I also adjust for each uh, the ratios of direct signal to early reflection. So for example, if an instrument is reasonably close by, um, then like uh, the cello position one, then there'd be um, uh, more, di there'd be equal direct signal to early reflection. And for an instrument like the chorus, that's uh, or keyboards and harp, that's uh, reasonably far away. There is less direct signal and more early reflection. The final stage of um, instrument staging 
is also I add a slightly different stereo feel to each instrument. Because we're sharing different staging positions, there is a chance that each of these early reflections will be the same. So the way I muddy that up a little bit is by using Logic's direction mixer, as you see, and just bending the stereo feel for each instrument just a little bit. So you can see it's just rotated around just to make a little bit of a difference. And finally, um, uh, virtual soundstage is not a reverb uh, program. What it does is it just generates the early reflection, which gives you a, uh, a uh, positional a sound. Um, each of my violin subgroups goes into a summing group, which then directs um, all the instruments to a singular reverb. So this is a shared reverb for the entire orchestra, which is my hall. And I've composed this using uh, FabFilters Pro R2. Um, and the string section uses actually two reverbs. So um, there's a subtle difference. If you notice the hall reverb send has a fully saturated mix. The second reverb has a very slight uh, reverb uh, return and uh, is also preceded by a delay. So there is a further blurring of the reflected sound. And in addition to reverb, what really defines the characteristic of a uh, modeled ensemble is the equalization. So here is the equalization I'm using for uh, the uh, Gustav Holtz strings. And uh, the uh, swarm instruments have a very excellent uh, uh, sordino. And, and you know, as I said, um, the uh, entire movement is played sordino, even though it goes up to fortissimo. But what I've done is I've made an EQ which actually accentuates that sort, you know, which takes off, uh, rolls off the high end. And um, the EQ, uh, I've got several pro subtle programs for different styles, different sounds. So my violin sections don't always uh, sound the same. And so finally, uh, the last stage of uh, putting together a performance like this is a conductor. Every orchestra has one. Um, and uh, performing these instruments disparately, there is a slight danger that you don't see the wood for the trees. So you need to be able to balance the sections against each other, to uh, control the dynamics uh, of each section, and to an extent realize what the composer has written down or what the composer's intentions were. So my conductor track is my VCA channel. So if I take you to my VCAs um, and turn automation on, you'll see uh, this is volume and there is consistent volume changes going through each section. So basically this is the conductor pulling down the dynamic of an instrument or raising it up again. And that takes a couple of passes because you need to be able to hear your uh, ensemble like a conductor. And you know, once you've gone through it maybe 10, 15 times, you start to be able to do this quite easily. I use a uh, Avid um, Artist Mix, which has got touch sensitive faders, so that's how I generate uh, this controller data. And the final stage of my mix is a tape plugin. I like the uh, Yuhi Satin tape machine uh, and I use the Master Bus Thick and Warm preset which is excellent for orchestras. I don't drive the input or output side. I have them straight at zero. And a little bit of uh, limiting with Fab Filters uh, Pro L2 with about uh, 4 dBs extra of boost set at a safe setting and I monitor through Sonarworks uh, headphone and 
speaker calibration, which gives me a very accurate reproduction. And also, um, just for a little bit of icing on the top, I uh, like to put in a uh, room tone into the mix, which I think makes uh, uh, things sound a little more real. Making my ensembles this way, I find I can bring personality to a piece because I have the ability to express myself with these instruments. Although the process might seem tedious, it's far from this. I find that I can actually work much more quickly than by wrestling with the sample library, trying to find that perfect articulation that's just right to communicate the musical intention I had in mind. The key to working with model instruments is to find a performance practice that works for you. Like any real instrument, playing a model instrument takes a bit of practice. You also do need to make a next-gen MIDI controller like a Leap, a GeoShred, a Rolly Seaboard or any other MIDI MP controller part of your workflow. The end result makes it all worthwhile. Thank you for watching and I hope you found this video useful.